John. First John. The small book of perpetual repeats has been contrasting the real from the fake. Those who really know God from those who don't or just say that they do. He began this chapter with his second warning about teaching. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. Don't believe everything you hear or read, even in the church. Especially in the church. Because that's who he's talking to. Everything that comes down the road isn't always scripturally sound, believe it or not. So test the spirits. Test the teaching to see if indeed this is from God. Now it could actually be cultic like in John's day with the Gnostics or in our day with the Jehovah's Witnesses or maybe it's just a side-tracking fad where Spiritual children or childish spiritual children get tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. Winds, they blow around, they shift, they blow in, they blow out. And unless we are anchored, we will get tossed around. Always ask. It doesn't matter who the teacher is, always ask, is what is being a spouse consistent with God's revealed word? Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path and necessary in a dark world. Everyone who hears my words and acts on them, does them, he's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when a flood occurred, the torrent burst against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. God's word is a solid rock foundation. Life has storms. We don't need extra storms coming from within. The Spirit of God will never contradict the word of God. Secondly, and of equal importance, John says, what is being said about Jesus himself, who is the living word? The fact is, and I repeat myself, we are basing our eternity on one person. We better get that one person right. John says, every spirit, every teaching that professes and confesses Jesus has come in the flesh, the unique, one and only Son of God, God the Son, who although he existed in the form of God from eternity past, emptied himself, took the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men, humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, Consequently, for this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Are they talking about that Jesus? King of kings, Lord of lords, if not, don't believe them. Jesus asked the disciples, who do people say that I am? Well, some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're a prophet. Some say you're a good teacher. Some say you're a nut. But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, 
the Son of the living God. That's who we're talking about. That's who we're lifting up. That's who we're putting our trust in. The finished work falls on him alone. As there is salvation in no one else. Do you believe that? For there's no other name under heaven that's been given among men by which we must be saved. So the test is Jesus lifted as the standard. Is he the central theme? Or is the teaching making Jesus a secondary issue? Church attendance. That's not salvation. Even baptism. You know, there are churches that teach if you want to be saved, be baptized. Well, we believe in baptism as an outward sign of what God has already done. And I fear that there will be many disappointed, yea, shocked people who stand before God with the excuse, well, I was baptized. And his response is, but I never knew you. Which is my lead in to John's point. You're thinking, finally. The one who loves knows God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Is. Meaning, in his essence, he cannot not be love. Not possible because he is. The great I am is love. And yet, we're still not saying everything to say about God, far from it. Because God is good. Good and upright is the Lord. He cannot not be good. I can, but he can't. He cannot not be upright. Chapter 1, God is light. And in him there is no darkness at all. Zero darkness. 100% light, 24-7. Which must be why James writes, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. He can't even cast a shadow because he is light. God is is holy. He cannot not be holy. In fact, there is none holy like the Lord. There's none beside you. There is no rock like our God. God is just. It's his very nature, which means he's always just. Righteousness means he always does the right thing. And justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. So even, even a couple of more descriptions there. Faithful. He cannot not be faithful. In fact, if we are faithless, and a lot of times we are, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. He cannot deny his essence. He is faithful. And if he said he wasn't, he'd be lying, which as far as we know is the only thing he can't do. You know why? Because he is truth. Steadfast, unchanging. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Maybe this doesn't do anything for you, but this blows my mind. He is 100% all of these things all the time. 
We are striving, we call it the sanctification process, we are striving to embrace a portion of these attributes day by day, but he is these things. So defining terms here is really important, particularly the words loveth and knoweth. Love, in this sense, is that unique, rarely used Greek word, agape. So John begins, verse 7, Beloved, agaped, let us love. Recipients of agape, this has to come first, freely you received, freely give. Now here it is in the Greek, which I cannot pronounce. Agape toy, agapo main. Those who are loved, let us love. Now we're not commanded to love one another to earn or become worthy of God's love. We love one another because we are loved by God and have received that love and live in light of it. It's important to note that this word for love does not mean tolerating everything. God actually disciplines because of his love. We discipline our children, or we should, because we love them. We don't want them to be out of control in the world. God is love, but just so you know, love is not God. So the silly bumper sticker that, sticker that says, love is love. Meaning, marry anything you want, or shack up with anything you want, or become a furry. I identify as an animal. Identify as, as whatever you want, and we're all obligated to go along with the charade, or we're not loving. That's not only silly, it's untrue. And it comes with dire consequences. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, this he'll also reap. The one who sows to the flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. So to justify fleshly, worldly, even ridiculous behavior under the guise of love will not end well. This isn't Beatles love. All you need is love. Then they broke up. So it's important that we define the word love properly and to understand the only way to agape is to have received it first. Now this becomes the test. No person on the planet except a born-again Christian is capable of agape. Now human beings are capable of being nice to one another without Christ. But it is impossible to agape without receiving it first from an external source. Further definition of terms, the word know or knoweth is used frequently in the New Testament is the Greek word ginosko and it means to know intimately. So when the angel came to Mary, he said, you will conceive in your womb, kind of intimate, and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. She's overwhelmed on many levels, but mostly she's overwhelmed because I know not a man. 
I've not been intimate with a man. How can this possibly be? Now, the word is used most often of husband-wife relationship, but John applies it to relationship with God, which is ultimately the same thing. We are the bride of Christ. Paul says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. For eternity, we are in gnosko intimate relationship with God. So marriage is actually a picture of eternity, which is why it's so sacred. But moving on, Peter used the word when after Jesus was arrested, a servant girl confronted him around a fire. This man was with him too, but he denied it saying, woman, I do not know him. Gnosko. I have no intimate knowledge of him. He even starts cussing. I don't know the man. And it was not talking about knowing of or an acquaintance because everyone in Jerusalem that night knew who Jesus was. But emphatically, I am not intimately familiar with this person. And when he said that a third time, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter wept bitterly because he was intimately acquainted and denied it having just committed spiritual adultery. So John says, proof that you know him. Proof that you have an intimate relationship with him, agape. I can only assume that if you're not at least growing in love, your Christian confession is baseless. You can't truly grow in your experience of God without also growing in love for one another. That's why not to get off on a tangent, why fellowship is so important. Because relationships don't happen in a vacuum. They happen together. He plants that spiritual DNA in our hearts when we are born again. So John can boldly say, he who does not agape couldn't possibly know God. Because that's what he plants within us. Well, let's add a layer of theology. Verse 9. By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. There's the whole gospel in two verses. For while we were helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Referring to everyone. Jesus did this for the whole world. And if we refer, refer back to chapter 2, he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not ours only, but also for the sin, those of the whole world. So Jesus died for every single person who has or ever will live. 
Unfortunately, not every single person will be saved. But God commends his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's personal. He died for everyone generally. He died for me personally. So to as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. And he has become the propitiation for our sin. Or I can personalize it. You can personalize it. Jesus is my Savior and Lord. He is the sacrifice which turned the wrath of God from me and placed it on himself. I'm paid off. I'm not a student loan. I don't need my neighbors to pay for me, for my stupidity. Jesus did it. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The debt is canceled. That's insanely great. Two of you, I think, think so. But this is insanely great. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, to take all of my sin. And now I'm in right standing with God because of him. And nothing can separate me from that. He done did it. Verse 11, we'll close with this. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. It's not too much to ask to take what we freely received to give it away. It's not too much to ask. And in fact, this is the great command. A new commandment I give to you, that you agape one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, he set the standard here, by this, men will know that you are my disciples, that you know me, if you have love for one another. So we take to heart John's words, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So we look for opportunities to take the love you've given us and give it out this week. We pray for your anointing and blessing. Lord, we love you. And we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.